Hey guys, uh, thanks for checking out this video. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd put together something with um, what we did on the workshop from Sunday afternoon for those of you who couldn't be there or for those of you who were um, as part of it but realized that we were quite rushed with time. So I just thought I'd um, do a little screen recording so essentially uh, you will not be seeing my face. I shall just be talking uh, talking some of the stuff that we mentioned in the workshop and going through my slides. Um, just um, rather than doing an intro, um, I basically just wanted to say I'm Pat from 1% Collective. Um, I'm founder of the charity, started it in November, will be turning two years old. Um, my history is music, photography and graphic design. And then I got into the world of volunteering, did a project called Good Karma Project and then moved on to Little Lotus Project, set that up with the street artist Misery. Did lots of trips to Thailand, Burma, and um, border working with them, refugee kids from Burma. Um, then I man started managing the charity and we started 1% Collective, so I kind of wear my two hats through the week. So just going to look at really the why um, and why of 1% Collective and how important that is in what you do. Um, when we did the workshop, we also had Laura um, from Rock and Roll um, and we had um, Sam as well from Generation Zero. So this is just my part um, that I'm going to talk through. So essentially a bit of storytelling and coffee. Well, um, first thing is I only started drinking coffee a few years ago and um, essentially that's where a lot of my storytelling happens is when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone and you are uh, yeah, having some coffees around Wellington, around Auckland. So this is where we um, first started with our why. Um, we had this for about a year and essentially, as, um, as you can probably tell, it's quite long. Um, it's also really hard if you're at a party and someone asks that, you know, that question, what do you do? And you have to kind of quickly come up with an answer and try and explain it, you know, hoping that you kind of, it's not so long that they, um, that they disappear and, and not so short that they don't have a clue what you're actually up to. So we had this for a year and, it, you know, we realized that it was really hard for us to actually have a conversation around it. And some of us would describe it in one way, our board members might describe it differently. So we needed to work on our why because then that would direct everything else we did as a charity. So over Christmas time, I, um, I spent, um, I read Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why again, which um, I recommend anyone um, to take the time to read. Um, also um, had a chat with one of Simon's workmates and, um, and he helped me brainstorm a little bit on my why. Um, and essentially what we came up with was this one. We exist to inspire generosity and to simplify regular giving so charities can spend more time working on impact and innovation and less time on fundraising. Um, so for us, it just makes things a lot shorter, sharper. It's a lot easier for us to have a chat to people about this. It means my board members, our ambassadors, people know exactly why we exist and the main areas that we work on and really what we're trying to achieve, which is that charities are freed up to use their brain power on actual impact and innovation and not always having to put in hours into what's the next event so we can exist and we can work on our cause. So yeah, so a few things with the importance of this why. Um, it drives you and it drives your story. So, you know, it's why you get up in the morning and um, why you do what you do. And it drives the stories that you tell people about why you do what you do. As I just mentioned, it simplifies things for your followers. So whether that's your board members, your ambassadors, um, you know, people just talking about you, um, you know, in the pub and trying to, in the cafe, trying to explain what you do. It's quite nice when you hear how other people explain what you do and, um, and how close they are. So when you have a sharp why, it does make it easier. It also means that whatever storytelling method you use, and that comes back to your why. So it really puts trust in that you're doing those storytelling methods because you're trying to reach your why. Um, measurable results. Um, for us, you know, we inspire generosity. It's quite hard to, um, to put um, an, an ROI, you know, a return on investment on, um, on the amount of people smiling and being inspired and, you know, maybe the amount of awesome hugs going around in the world. Um, so that's a tougher part. But dollar value for what we raise for our charities, we can measure that and we can measure that regular giving is creating measurable dollars um, that are coming in every day for our charities, um, which is matching our why. It also helps you to say no. So essentially, you're going to be obviously excited about what you're up to. Um, and there's lots of things you could potentially do. Um, and having a good why just means that you do have the potential to say, actually, no, that does not match our why. Um, so I'm not going to put my time into it. And essentially, you know, if you're a charity and you have a board, um, they might say no as well because, hey, that's not matching your why. So it is, it is pretty good in that way that it does help them um, keep you on track and um, with what you're up to. A few quotes and a few people just um, really worth checking out. Um, you know, Brené Brown, um, amazing book. 
um, if you get a, get a chance to read her book, Daring Greatly. Um, vulnerability is a birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. Now, um, I won't on this video talk about um, too much about these guys, but Derek Sivers, well worth watching his TED talk and um, his TEDx talk and reading his book. Um, amazing guy, very open with um, the challenges and then what he's learned through his time of running his um, old company CD Baby um, and the challenges of actually passing it on and selling that company and how hard it was because it was his, his baby. Um, read his book, Amanda Palmer's TED Talk, incredible about the art of asking and how, you know, when you put yourself out there and be vulnerable, um, that ask, um, you know, shows that you are human and get so many people involved. And Jimmy Hunt, most incredible speaker in New Zealand um, from the charity, he started them, co-founded the charity Live More Awesome. Um, Jimmy, from me, saw him speak at TEDx um, in Auckland a year or two ago. Um, his biggest point was, you know, reaching out and asking for help when you need it. Um, I took that advice at one point when we were looking for 50 people to help fund um, the existence of 1% Collective. Um, we had a bunch of people signed up, but you know, we weren't close to our 50. Um, and really, you know, I was struggling and wrote a real honest, open email explaining the challenges um, and how hard it was and what we we're trying to achieve. Um, and was really open and vulnerable with them, you know, with what we were up to and, and you know, how hard I was finding it. Um, and essentially, we, we managed to get about 19 um, new members kind of in, in the next few days after that um, from that email. So, yeah, amazing advice from Jimmy, you know, just ask for help when you need it. Seth quote, marketing is no longer about the stuff you make, but about the stories you tell. I think we all know this, that, um, you know, storytelling obviously is so key um, and companies can see the value in that, that there's obviously so much competition. If you have a story that people resonate with, then um, it makes it makes things so much stronger with what you do. Um, I mean, Blake Mikowski with his Tom Shoes, how, you know, to buy one, give one model helps kids um, in developing countries. Obviously, it then has such a story and he's got a really interesting history. His book is pretty amazing. Scott Harrison from Charity Water in the States. Yeah, his story, if you get a chance to go to the Charity Water website and the About Us page, check out his story. Um, it's about a 45 minute video, but yeah, it's, um, it's pretty incredible what he's achieved. Um, you know, one guy with a vision to get clean water into the world. Um, and the way that they tell stories at Charity Water, their video and their photography, um, their events, really um, inspirational. So The Dragonfly Effect is a book that I would really encourage everyone to read. You'll see here I've just grabbed a screenshot from their website. Um, and really, you know, it's got the four parts of the wing. One, focus. So find your goal. So what are you trying to achieve? How can you grab attention with step two? So how do you make people look? Once you've made them look, how do you engage with those people? How do you get you know, personal connections going on? And then four, take action. You know, how do you get those people to basically be your ambassadors and take action for you and start spreading your movement? So um, I'm just gonna talk a bit about a few of the things 1% Collective does, but I encourage you all to check out um, the Dragonfly Effect book. One thing when you're thinking about your why, you know, some people obviously um, might not have an idea of what they want to get into. Um, and one thing I think about is, you know, what pisses you off and what do you want to change? So, um, and I mean, it doesn't have to be, you know, like a really negative thing. It could be, um, it could be you want more hugs in the world. Right, I'm going to start building a movement as to how we can get more people hugging, you know, how we can get more high fives going on. Um, or is it that you hate when you go to a shop um, and they give you plastic bags all the time? You're going to start a movement to try and stop that happening. Um, you know, think about personally, if you're going to put a lot of your life to this new time, it needs to be something that you want to get up for in the morning and you want to see change and you want to find people to join your movement to make that happen. So our storytelling methods with 1% Collective, we um, essentially do a lot of them um, looking at who inspires us. So we do these generosity talks. So as you can see, people like Seth Godin, Lady Six, and four simple questions, so it's really easy for you to do, easy for them to answer, and we have a real simple structure on how we place it into our design files and how we do it online. And it just makes life easy, you know, if it's gonna be a challenge every week to put these out, then you're not gonna kind of keep up with it. So um, yeah, essentially we do these, um, generally every week we do charity stories as well, and um, so we mix it in. Um, and you'll see this example, Brett McKenzie, you know, we interview him, Flight of the Concords posted up and you get um, over two and a half thousand people liking this and a whole heap of comments. Um, so for us, you know, that is inspiring generosity and we're getting the help of then. We've got to that stage, obviously, where we Flight of the Concords start taking that into their own hands and sharing it out there. We've done a video campaign and um, where we had uh, Mark Alveston, um, award-winning director, um, take it on, on, on board to do us um, a video all, all through for his time, volunteers, 
We had people like Lady Six, and we had other musicians. We had Lauren Horsley, and we had a heap of amazing kids. It meant that it grabbed people's attention. So it was that part of grabbing people's attention. They then wanted to find out more, went to our website, and then and joined the collective, so started signing up. So it got us a lot of new donors, and it got us a lot of interest in um, the creative world of New Zealand as well, who kind of saw that, um, that you know, there is kind of a lot of charities looking at doing more eye-catching, exciting, creative things and new, new methods of trying to engage with people there. Um, we're also launching a publication in November, so um, obviously this slide is pretty blank for the moment because the cover is being worked on, um, but yeah, we're launching the Generosity Journal in November, so um, keep an eye on that one. Now, with engaging with people, we, we do business talks. So sometimes it's just myself. I go in, I talk about generosity. Um, luckily, this time at zero, we had Adam Page, the musician. We played Friday night and during their drinks. And, and people listened to me talking about generosity and then listened to Adam talking about generosity in his world of music. And he played an amazing set for them. That's all um, on our YouTube channel if you want to check a few of those videos out. Um, so it's a way that we can actually engage. And then now, you know, we have many zero staff who donate through us and, um, and and help us with how we use Xero. Um, I've done these talks to a few other companies um, and also we have um, our gatherings, so collective gatherings, so where we invite some of our members, some of our donors to come along and chat to the charities that we work with, have a beer, meet each other, and um, sometimes we ask them for their advice. Um, if we're trying to look at a new, any kind of new ideas, we try and get their feedback on it. Um, and again, that's the way that people engage and they come out and they've actually had a real life experience of meeting good people. Um, Events as well is obviously really important. Pretty, um, you know, pretty challenging to pull off at times. Events, but we've done some small uh, music events. People like um, Warren Maxwell, Thomas Oliver, um, Louis Baker, The Nudge, um, and people have had a great time and kind of learned a bit about our charities while having fun and while raising money for the charities as well. Um, so a bit more of a kind of subtle way there. Plus, we we've made a few videos at some of the talks as well. Um, a few other things. Um, you know, before I get onto your real life action steps, you know, with taking action, we really, we try and get people excited about generosity, get them to be ambassadors. It means that they'll talk about it with their friends. They'll say, hey, have you heard of 1% Collective? You guys should check it out. And this is what they're up to. So we've had a lot of media attention from that, from people um, reaching out to their friends and starting that collective kind of movement um, of speaking to people. Um, it also means that businesses start getting involved and they've started looking at how they can incorporate 1% Collective ideas and, and ethos into their business model. Um, they've started and you know people come to us with ideas of I want to do an auction and I want all the money to go to you guys I want to do this jacket and all the money goes to you guys you know a, a mixture of things so that's when it's great because it takes it away from us and people are starting their own elements of the movement there which um, of course we absolutely love so um, pretty much last thing I'm going to talk about is um, real life action steps this is the biggest thing um, really I think for me is to-do lists I'm a to-do list addict and um, I write them every few days just dump your brain onto paper and get everything you need to do out there um, no matter what it is it just means that your brain is a bit more freed up to actually just um, be, in, be controlled by your list really be controlled by your to-do list and your email um, inbox um, in order to kind of carry on through your movement um, I talked to Derek Sivers um, before um, this workshop about you know for him what was the key thing um, what would he see as the most important thing in starting a movement and he was he was the same real life action steps you know he he basically said it is thinking about if you're going to start a movement what skills do you need you know what courses do you need to learn what books do you need to read what TED talks do you need to be inspired by what skills do you need to know web design skills do you need to know um, in design photoshop so you can put together your presentations to then go and speak to people about your movement and keep that going um, who do you need to meet you know do you need to have um, coffees with people in the industry um, that you're that you're working in and that you that your movement's heading towards um, do you need to reach out to re some really inspiring people not in, not even in new zealand you know in the around the world um, and say hi and just tell them how awesome they are and maybe ask them advice you know, the worst they can say is no, and that's the biggest thing we've learned is just reach out, and because, yeah, the worst they can say is no, best that'll happen is you may start working with them, you may get awesome advice, you may interview them, um, and they may get involved in your movement. So um, really, you know, who are the people that you need to make your movement or make um, things happen? Um, get it all down in a to-do list and just start working through it. Obviously, creating a movement's a big way up there idea, 
but the micro steps to doing it are the easy things, the weekly things you can start ticking off. And the next thing you know, suddenly you'll have, have your movement, um, have people involved. Suddenly you'll be following those steps of the dragonfly effect. And um, you can just keep, uh, keep growing people and um, keep growing things to make the world um, more awesome. So yeah, here's my email address, pat at onepercentcollective.org. Um, feel free to share this um, video if you would like with um, anyone who's keen to just know a little bit more about what One Percent Collective are up to um, and how we've kind of got to our why. And um, yeah, feel free to email me if you'd like to know anything about any of those books or people or any ideas around that. Or if you want to join us with your 1%, you know, 1percentcollective.org, we've got the sign up there. So um, yeah, thank you for listening and um, go well.